we've got one more match for you this evening, or at least it's evening for us, or is it maybe technically morning at this point? But we've got one more match before we finish up this week, the Hearthstone Global Games and Raven. And joining me, as always, for this thing is going to be Sotil, and we've got a... Uh, Bit of a different sort of speed matchup, I would say, in terms of lineups at least. Yep, we're going to throw a curveball into the mix. Kazakhstan have come into this with a very different stance on what this tournament meta looks like from everyone else. It seems, um, even on day one, everyone seemed to agree that this was going to be a very greedy meta game. And then day two, people started to respond to that with their bans being a little bit different. Yeah. We started seeing uh, Miracle Rogues get banned. We started seeing Recruit Hunters get banned. And then we started to see Quest Rogue come into the tournament, you know, by the people that had the read that Quest Rogue was the deck to bring because the tournament was going to be very mm. greedy. Those, of course, getting banned as well. Kazakhstan seemed to disagree just a little bit. They've got seven out of nine aggro variations, if you want to use the term very loosely, of the classes that you could bring. So so uh, this could be a, another quick one after the 3-0 that we just watched. Yeah, before we dive too much into the list and to the matchups, let's take a look at the teams themselves and who is going to be there. As I would say there is one name that really sticks out on Team Kazakhstan, and it is Naaman. Ah, Snowdrop. <laughs> I mean, Snowdrop was on the team last year, right? Uh, but his name, and you know, he, you've seen him at championships, you've seen him in playoffs. He's probably, you know, the, the star player and, and maybe not too much in the spotlight this year, I would say. Maybe kept a bit of a low profile overall, but I'm sure he's not, you know, lost any skill at the game because he was one of the, uh, he's probably been playing the game for one of the longest times out of, uh, out of these names in global games. Yeah, I mean, started the, started the game at the earliest point, maybe. There was a bit of a, bit of a gap in okay, there sure, for, for sure. various reasons. But yeah, you can take a look at the wonderful vistas of Kazakhstan here. But yeah, I think Kazakhstan, one of the true underdog teams in the tournament. Right. It's, it's easy to say. You know, Neyman is, a, is definitely a high-quality player, a potential top-tier player. But it's a lot of work for him to do to support you know three other players who just don't really have any global experience on, on high-level tournament play. Whereas Taiwan, of course, have our still current reigning and defending world champion Tom60229 and the AHQ boys supporting that as well. AHQ is a, uh, a tag, a team, a uh, sponsor that we've seen floating around in Hearthstone for quite a long time, really right. representing some of Taiwan's best. Yeah, and it's definitely the more robust team, as you said, instead of just having one star player. They obviously have the world champ, as you mentioned, but a good sort of support group around him and uh, a lot of current experience as well, as a lot of those players do play in the playoffs pretty regularly, actually. It's not a surprise to see these names pop up every single time we have a playoff but let's take a look at the picks and bands so we can see what's going on with these deck lists and if this is going to be a fast one just like the 3-0 Lorinda and Falcone had yeah, so the mage is going to bite the dust immediately for Kazakhstan, which means Taiwan seems to have taken a look at this lineup and said, hey, if you want to play aggro, play aggro, because mage right. was one of the control decks that they had. Of course, there is an aggro variant available, but it seems Kazakhstan hasn't trusted it, has gone with control mage. That's got banned out. Then they picked up probably the their two most uh, stable decks in the meta right now with uh, the hunter and the warlock, although the warlock is zoo. And then again, next ban phase, warrior goes down again. So that was the quest warrior for Kazakhstan. So that is both of the control decks eliminated as soon as possible by Taiwan. Yeah, and the big thing that sticks out for me, just again, just sticking with Kazakhstan for a second, is the even shame. And we've talked a lot over the past couple of days. Everyone is bringing Shudder Walk. Like, we've cast probably more Shudder Walk in the past few days than you've seen in the past few weeks. But the even shaman is going to be played. And, and, you know, we'll see when we get into it. But for me, I feel like it's a deck that's good but just not quite there still i think yeah in comparison to the other option yes, that yeah you in can comparison bring, to right? shadow like, yeah. shadowwalk shaman in particular like going into this tournament i said right in our lead in that it everyone seems to have the read apart from kazakhstan this is going to end up being a very greedy yeah. tournament meta so shadowwalk shaman just seems to make sense for that kind of inevitability that you have against the control decks whereas even shaman has to do it more honestly they have the tools to do it they can have the aggressive push early against control decks and then fall back on Hagatha later for yep. a plan b or even in uh, glory's case uh, the summer playoffs a plan a which made me look quite the fool but we will have a now look at how this series is going to play out now that we have the matchup information and actually just looking at those first few games that is odd rogue versus shudderwalk shaman winnable then it's the uh, recruit hunter versus the Quest Warrior. 
very winnable. winnable. <laughs> and then it could potentially come down to that even Shaman we were just talking about taking on Mali Druid, potentially with a 3-0 sweep, a second 3-0 sweep of the day on the line after seeing precisely zero 3-0 sweeps in the first two days combined. Yeah, the potential is there, but let's just take a, you know, a, a few seconds to discuss the Rogue versus the Shaman matchup, which sure. we're going to be kicking off with. Uh, you know, Rogue or Odd Rogue, one of the most aggressive decks in, in the game right now in yeah. terms of just sheer early game power. And look at Stardrop's comfortable. He's ready. He's got the neck pillow. He's looking good. And there's uh, Shaxi looking pretty pretty all, all about business, to be completely honest at this yeah. point. But talk about the decks. Ken, from from the few times I've played the matchup, I sort of dip in and out of Shudderwalk as Shudderwalk's gone up and down in play since its release. But in the matchup, I feel like a singular healing rain actually just just can ruin the rogue to quite a large extent because you run enough removal to get the early job done a lot of the time with Shudder Walk. And then that one healing rain is so difficult for Rogue, who normally runs out of resources past turn fives onwards, maybe turn seven is a little bit fairer, to actually just gain all of that damage back again. Yeah, I think healing rain is definitely a crucial card. Uh, but, you know, Rogue can generate enough stats to make a lot of the removal awkward. They're... The minions in the deck are quite thick for an aggro deck, right? There's the Cobalt Scale Banes yeah. and so on that can become huge threats. Uh, and that makes Volcano very important as well, because although they can resist the Lightning Bolts and the, uh, the the Lightning Bolt Lightning Storm kind of removal package with some bigger minions, with a with a growing Hench Clan Thug, with a Cobalt Scalebane board, it's really hard for them to pull out of range of a Volcano setup, which means Volcano one turn into like Healing Rain a couple of turns later, that's usually the one-two punch. Right, and this was like the laziest mulligan in the world for me if I'm on Team Taiwan, because I like all all of those cards. Do you have any arguments? Uh, you want to keep Hex? That would be my I, first argument. Well, I, I am worried about, maybe overly worried, about the world in they have a double three drop threat that you they, you know they might create a little bit awkward of forcing a volcano early okay. as opposed to maybe volcano in turn six or seven okay. when some of the bigger guys that you were talking about the fungomancer the scalebane when those are down you volcano and after that it's hard to push but if you just want to you know, Volcano, because there's a hench clan you actually can't kill, then that's a little bit of a worry for me. Fair enough. The Hex did go, though. So, I mean, I will admit that's the the, the one I would throw if you made me throw one I'm away, but... Okay, I was about to say something good came into that slot <laughs> based on Taiwan's reaction to the mulligan. And yes, yeah, Knight Chain Gang, I was about to make a prediction on Keliseth, just flying into that <laughs> one-card mulligan just to wrap it up. But yeah, okay, Knight Chain Gang, fair enough. Yep. And then... Diamond's there, Hero Power's there, as it often is in, in Hearthstone. And there's two three drops, but the Blink Fox definitely not the powerhouse, right? Yeah, yep. it, it's, it's the three drop that adds that extra boost sometimes, but it's more for redundancy of having something to play on three. Sure. And it's not a Hench Cloud, uh, Hench Clan or a Flappy Bird. God, even the Earth Shock's good, right? If there's, for example, the early pushes Rogue can do where they just stick Cold Blood on something. Doesn't really matter what they call. Well, I mean, even point. like that that two card combo to deal with a hench clan thug, even right? If it comes yeah, down that's, as, that's as true, it comes yeah. down as a full health minion, you can just earth shock lightning bolt it and get rid of it, or just earth shock it and leave it on the board if you really want to. Because when a hench clan thug doesn't have its card text, it's not a very big threat. <laughs> Can't imagine a world where there's just cold blood past this. <laughs> Seems unlikely. They're probably just planning the next few turns, to be honest. Just yep. like, okay, if we weapon, we probably play Hench Clan. Then they have Blink Fox Cold Blood, but how mm -hmm. safe is the Hench Clan or the Mole at this point? The Mole is nice, though, because the Hench Clan is normally the, the direct instant high priority target. So it means it's more likely that the Mole lives, as a Lightning Storm doesn't really kill a Hench Clan anyway. Mm -hmm. So the Mole won't be caught in any, you know, sort of collateral damage sort of thing. Yeah, I agree. That looks like the curve to me as well. It's just dagger on two, it's three drop on three, and then it's three drop cold blood on four if you have uh, that option available to you. Speaking of options, Shaxi has a lot right now. Just the, the the game looks about as safe as it wants to be. You don't have Grumble, Shudder Walk, any of these late game. Even a Zola can be awkward right now. You don't have any of those sort of combo cards, which might sound bad in a lot of instances. But when all you're worried about is not dying for the first seven turns of the game, this is a beautiful hand at this point. Yep. Are you brave enough to just hero power, though? I think that's probably just the play, personally. 
I don't see Co any great reason to overreact to any of this. Like, even calling Manatai to just say he'll trade into it and draw one. Yeah, it just draws one card. But right? you also have Sirenite. You also have Volcano. It looks like they're going to... Oh, they're going for Ooze. Okay. okay. I, mean, I mean, I can get on board with this. This was the only play that I can see that was better than just um, pressing Totem in some worlds. Uh, I think with the quality of the hand that they had, though, I personally would be taking this a little bit slower. But yeah, I mean, coining out Ooze on the, the Charge of the Dagger is definitely... Uh, merits to it, and now if the Hench Clan does come down on the following turn, they can just go like Totem Lightning Bolt on it and not have to worry about the Earthshock mess, right? And it also... Actually, no, the more I break this down, this makes a ton of sense, because... <laughs> Sol's convinced himself at this I point. I mean, yeah, like, this is this is casting, right? You have to say the first thing that comes into your head a lot of the time. And I then, do that a lot yeah, of the time. Yeah, so sometimes you talk yourself out of it, um, because now they're set up against any 3-drop that comes down, right? Like, Hench Clan Thug, they've already got a 3-3 challenging on the board, same thing with uh, with Vicious Fledgling, whereas if they didn't do this, they would have to react to that threat with, you know, a Shock Lightning Bolt or Spell Damage Totem Lightning Bolt or something to be able to deal with it. So it just looks too clean in terms of just getting ahead of the game to me. Right. And this the worry here is this hero power Cold Blood sets up a weapon and either pushes face or kills the 3-3. Three -three. But I feel like it's just too slow. You need to stay a minion ahead. You are playing an almost a Zeus-style deck. Sol's eyes are wide because of a Wind Speaker. That's a Wind Fury minion right there. That's 20 damage from hand when they draw Leroy. That is true. I'm not going to argue with that mathematics. That's a lot of damage. And it's also not a lot of damage for the rogue to have to push to get there, right? Yeah. It's not often right. you're going to healing rain on 20 as long as you don't see a seven minion board, obviously. Exactly. But perhaps more realistically, it's any minion that sticks for the rest of the game gets Windspeaker cold-blooded. Yes. And then it just pushes a million damage. It's like a min minimum of plus five, right? Yeah. Or plus nine, I guess. How adventurous are you feeling with the value trade right now? I think uh, taking the like-for-like like trade just makes your opponent's turn more difficult. If you take the value trade, yes, you've got a 3-3 on the board, but they don't have to break their curve to kill your Manatide Totem. Right. Here, they have to break your curve. Uh, you have to dagger up, and because you're playing an odd deck, because you're playing an odd deck, you then cannot allocate your resources properly, right? You've spent two mana daggering up to kill the Manatide. The rest of your turn is going to be very weak. But now... Come turn six, any minion that sticks to the board is getting Windspeaker double cold-blooded. So and that's going to make a real mess because that's kind of how the removal in Shudderwalk Shaman works, right? You look at a small board, you say, don't care. I'll wait two turns yeah. and then I'll Volcano you then. <clears throat> that's kind of scary. It is because it's, like, like you say, it's so much damage that you can't account for. And because the only real heal, Life Drinker is heal, of course, before everyone jumps at me, but the only real heal you've got is that Healing Rain, and you never want a Healing Rain for five, right? Like, yeah. that, is, that is not the power of the card. That is almost never the plan. And you don't expect Wind Fury in this deck, apart from a, a little pink bird sometimes. With that said, Cold Blood this turn, yeah, I was just going to try and get this in before they just threw it out, but, like, Hench Clan Cold Blood this turn is just such a great answer to the board state. Um, that they might end up just going for it here, but this is going to get answered so cleanly with the hand that Taiwan have available to them. Uh, Shock Lightning Bolt, or now even Glacial Shard as well, are just such clean answers to the board state, and the decision to go face here from Kazakhstan is going to potentially get punished by that Mana Tide going absolutely wild in the future turns because of how good the removal options are for, yeah. for Taiwan. They could even hold the Earth Shock and get a Glacial Shard on the board instead because that just buys time to, to Volcano anyway. You're more than likely going to Volcano a bigger board next turn yep. if required. If not, you still have Sirenite, Chain Gang, and Earth Shock to follow up with. I do understand... <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. I do understand this, though, because... This might gain you even more damage from that Windspeaker combo because you've already pushed some. And then if next turn you can land Windspeaker Coldblood, but that's just 
even more on top of an already powerful turn. Yeah, and I think it was just it was just mana utilization as well, yeah. right? Like, you know, they had to play a hen they had to either dagger up and do nothing essentially or henchman cold blood. That was that was basically their options for doing anything efficient. I think go with either of the removal options and we see Taiwan just playing this like slower than I thought they would. Because they have so so much great removal, I thought they'd just be like, no, you know, like there goes your early push. But now they're just getting the Saranite down, saying, you know what? Nothing really adds up that well. It's not likely that these two taunts just are made to disappear. Mm -hmm. So these minions can hit face. And look, like two volcanoes now. Still the Lightning Bolt, still the Earth Shock, still the Glaceo Shard. Whenever they want, they can just hit the brakes on this game. Yeah, there's not a lot that you get punished by here, really. I mean, you're set up really nicely against Fungal Mancer. The, the, the two minions just get buffed and they trade into your two threes right. and then you're happy to deal with that next oh, turn. You have plenty of removal that deals with it. Um, you're, it's not like they, the opponent can Vile Spine you and really get a good tempo push here because they have no combo activator for their, their five mana Vile Spine. Uh, SI isn't a worry, really, because because of that Gluttonous Ooze early on, basically, is what's made Kazakhstan's uh, curve so early from this point. Right. And we do see the, in a different way, the Wind Fury being used to push more damage with the Cold Bloods. And I think this was because there just wasn't a better turn and any other play, i.e. the SI7 Agent, just did nothing right. last turn. This, although it looks a little bit wishy-washy, there's still, what, 12 power on the board that needs to be answered. And Kazakhstan might think that the answers aren't there from Taiwan because they've had opportunity to play removal, but not. I wonder. It's possible. The only thing that worries me about this game so far is a lack of daggers. Yeah, that's what it's I said. Like... You just lose. The whole point of your deck is how powerful that dagger is, and they've not really utilized that at all, and that's four damage for two mana. Yeah, and it's just down to how savage that, that coin gluttonous who's play was early on, because, again, like the way Odd Rogue works, you can only really efficiently re-dagger on your odd turns, right? Like, after turn two, yep. when you press dagger, it's only efficient to do it on the odd turns after that, because on turn five, for example, you can dagger plus a three drop. But if you're going to re-dagger on turn four, it's so unlikely that you make a smooth curve out of that. Um, so they just haven't been able to put things together because of how uh, destructive that Gluttonous Ooze was early on. And it's just kind of snowballed to this position that you see now. And this Mana Tide, what is that card number three? The Mana Tide's drawn right now? And that could have been gone. There could be three cards less deep at this point if they just traded into it. Obviously less health, uh, sorry, more health. Yeah, they'd less be, on, damage be on 19 with two less cards in hand, I believe right. would be the exact situation. And now with the one thing about using the Cold Blood meant that the, there goes your Vile Spine Activator, right? Like, not that there's any big targets to kill in terms of, you know, use the Vile Spine scene, taking down Lich Kings and stuff. Mm -hmm. Still, Acolyte of Pain. Manatide. These are all good targets. And you develop a 3-4. Yep. We are going to see the dagger at last, though. Yeah, finally it comes back up. And, and I like this. They're just going face, right? I imagine the 2-1 oh. has to die. Oh, yeah, okay. there's... I, I mean, what's your plan if you go face in this spot? Your 9-3 you're, 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 you're dies on board to the, the Acolyte and the the Glacial Shard, and then at that point, like, all they need is a Lightning Bolt, another Glacial Shard, just anything that deals with your Vicious Fledgling for a turn. Like, you've used both Cold Bloods, so you're not on the Leroy Cold Blood plan. Right. You just have to find some way of getting I, control of the board. Yeah, I mean, I do have the cast division, but I I just live in a world as the Rogue where they've drawn so many cards, it is extremely unlikely there isn't Hex, there isn't there isn't Lightning Ball, there isn't Volcano, there isn't Lightning Storm, there's I mean, so many tools. Take that argument and flip it on its head. You're going face. It's, if In your world, it's also extremely unlikely they don't have a Healing Rain yet, right? So That's like two Healing Rains versus all the other removal, though. But yeah, it's not all the other removal. You're playing around more removal yeah, by trading the 2-1 off the board, right? At that point, they need a removal okay. that kills both of your threats, whereas if you leave the 2-1 up, they only need a Lightning Bolt or an Earth Shock. Okay, this, because of Overload, this is where you just have to stop and just think about your turn right now and plan it for the future. Yep. Because if you just play Healing Rain and Hero Power, hmm. great, but Healing Rain is now minus six, unless the Hero Power is exactly torn. So is this worth another Volcano and saying, well, you've just not got much left? They think, they probably think the card on the left is Leroy or 
Baku, I would say. Maybe Valspine as well. I yeah, I think that is pretty much the entirety of what that card could be. Especially when like the first SI was used to prop the second SI. If yeah. there was any other card, it would have been used instead. Mm -hmm. Deadly poison. Okay. It's a pretty horrible draw. They needed like another three drop, honestly, that turn. But I agree with Snowdrop and Team Kazakh uh, Kazakhstan here, where. Play your stuff. Let's go. Yeah. There's no there's no point waiting for a Vile Spine. To set up Lethal on board, they have the Baku to follow it up. But we can see Healing Rain is a little bit uh, a little bit more powerful this turn as there's half the damage available in minions, though. Yeah, and then with another uh, overload free turn to come up after this, finally, they will be in business. With, uh, they'll rip the far sight here, they'll play the Healing Rain, and then they have uh, now three mana Grumble available, but it's potentially the Hex that they might need coming up against this Baku. All right, both Volcanoes gone. So yeah. they're, they're normally you even... It's funny to think of Volcano as a single target removal, but it is just as much as it's a huge AoE board-wide removal as well. Right. I will this they're definitely not out of the woods yet, are they? And I don't quite know how. Kazakhstan, Odd Rogues just had enough, just enough to keep being awkward. There is the Hex, though. They're entitled to have one. You know, they're 20 cards into their deck. I think Kazakhstan play this Baku expecting it to be Hexed. They'll just be a little frustrated when they learn that it comes off the top. Can still push seven minimum next turn. Yep. And this Life Drinker, it's a great card, but it only heals for three. But once it's in the bank, there's the Shudderwalk in hand as well, which means that Taiwan can start healing for six a turn because they've got that discounted Grumble as well, which will help them speed things up. Still a couple of turns away, though. Yeah, and it's still with only one Chain Gang played. It's still quite high failure rate as well, even after the Grumble. County Glacial Shard, I yes. believe. Yep. Also saves the Hex. You can Grumble instead now. Glacial Shard again. I see me. Yeah, this is much better yeah. than just dropping the and hex because it gets them that it gets them through the one turn that I was struggling with, which is where you find the turn to um, get essentially the Shadowwalk activator done, like either the Zola or the Grumble. Whereas now that they're in that position, they can just kind of deal with this board state on the following turn and play some life drinkers, uh, and then because they've already gone through kind of the Zola and Grumble position, they're like, they're a turn closer to just being able to play Shadowwalk and right. really end the game. I can play the hand out here with Deck Hand and Fungal Mancer. So that's going to be six damage push right now. Also, just double checking, but no IMB Cowl in Kazakhstan's list, which oh. also would have made a big difference. Cheeky lethal from nowhere. Yeah. I wonder. Can can Kazakhstan really do anything except Fungal Mancer deckhand face? They could trade some minions to try and protect the value of their 7 8 on the board if they want to go into that world. Just dagger up and use the deckhand to take out two minions and try and keep some of the board I, state. I mean, I, you asked if there's an alternative. I'm not saying I particularly yeah. am in love well, with that alternative. With one healing there. ring gone, I'm just like, Leroy, let's go. Nope, I'm with you. I just kind of not with us though. Yeah, I can go for the trade to try and protect the board as well. The, the Valspine is buffed as well with this Fungomancer. You would not drop the buff onto the Baku because of that gigantic card you can see on the screen right now. Yeah. Spread your threats. Maybe Kazakhstan have picked up some kind of read over the course of the game that Hex wasn't there. I don't think you can make you can take it off the previous turn. I think. You know, getting Glacial Sharded as you did with the Zola, Glacial Sharding again, I think as a team you can recognize that that play was better than Hexing the 7-8. So I don't think you can eliminate Hex from the equation based on that, but maybe they've got some kind of read from the previous turns that it wasn't there, because remember the Hex was very new to the hand. It was top yep. decked on that turn uh, when the Baku was played. So I think that's the kind of play where you really hope your opponent doesn't have it, but there's the full clear, there's a three-mana Grumble, and the saw there, just the little... <sighs> The little screwed up face. Just accepting perhaps that that was the turn that's ended the game now. 
Huh. Play some Life Drinkers, play some Chain Gangs. Taiwan are very much in business. Should Van Cleef have come down there, do you think? Because with the second swing of the dagger in Leroy... I think it's a very futile thing to argue about at this point. So, no? Well, I mean, <laughs> what, so, so what you say, the Edwin adding two damage makes Leroy lethal off the top? Right. Well, the Grumble trades into the 2-2, right? So... Sure. It's not like Taiwan are particularly worried if they don't push damage. I mean, yes, they have just got lethal out of it the way that it's ended up. But, you know, if they yeah. if they didn't have to, they're quite happy to trade a 7-7 seven, seven into a 2-2 two, two with the deck that they're playing. But anyway, there goes the dream of the Kazakhstan 3-0. And I would say that a uh, Taiwan 3-0 is quite unlikely because the next match that they're going to have to deal with is Quest Warrior on their side versus the Recruit Hunter. Yeah, that's going to be definitely a tough one because the Warrior just doesn't really do much against hordes of gigantic minions. And also the Death Rattles make cards like Warpath, which uh, is normally a fantastic removal tool, just not good enough because you, you Warpath in minions that aren't as much of a threat into minions that are threats. Yeah, what I will say is there is a small window because this is kind of a classic Recruit Hunter. It's not the Egg Cube version. Uh, so there is kind of a finite number of threats right. in the deck, right? And sometimes you don't draw enough of them. Sometimes you draw too many beasts. All of them. <laughs> yeah, and you, the activators don't work. However, even in that world, you still have that, that fallback plan of Deathstalker Rexar to, to come back on to just keep generating infinite threats anyway. So, you know, a series of very unfortunate events has to occur for the, the hunter not to come out of this one with a win. It really does. It, to, it would have to be, again, a, a very quick quest proc. And then just get them a few eights to the face. I yep. mean, if anyone can do it, the world champ can put it that way. But I think it is going to be difficult because n no matter what they draw, even in a rough order, as you mentioned, there are only so many executes. There are only so many brawls. And brawl isn't even that effective in this version of the deck because you normally don't go that wide. Mm -hmm. If you go in that wide, you're hitting them for eight and seven every turn. So... You're dead. There's not much you can do, so it's going to be a tough one. Yeah, Brawl, like, quite often just kills one minion, and then you're playing around it a lot of the time anyway as the hunter, so Brawl will kill one minion, and that minion will be Kathrena, and then... That, that, <laughs> like, like, okay, go! Yeah, it's it's not a good card in the matchup, but um, still, it's... it's. I expected maybe the, the Rogue to do a little bit better in the matchup. You know, you saw that they still kind of got there with raw damage, and right. they had quite a poor opener. Uh, whereas Taiwan had quite a strong opener. You saw how good the Gluttonous Ooze was, completely destroying the game plan, and that kind of left Rogue with basically nothing to do with several turns afterwards, and they still just nearly kind of got there with raw damage right afterwards. Um, so my, my dreams of an aggro 3-0 in the Hearthstone Global Games were very quickly put out to pasture, and uh, now it's, it's, if anything more likely that Taiwan will be able to do it. Because if they do pull out the Miracle here with the Quest Warrior, they then have Mali Druid up against Even Shaman, which yeah. is, again, a very winnable matchup for the Mali Druid because Even Shaman, although it's the aggressive board-developing deck, it's not going to kill you on turn four, turn right. five. So suddenly Spreading Plague comes into play. It, even decks there. that are built to not give you time, Mali Ghost can keep pace with. So yep. decks that are a bit slow and, you know, like, just grindy sort of, they're just not going to be good enough. We see the two players there, you might recognize the guy on the right. Yeah, it's Frodan, right? Wow. Pretty famous. Both of them, I guess. But yeah, current world champion in there. With some unconventional play as well. Let's just rewind time a little bit back into when we were in Amsterdam. And, and in the finals, that keep of, of UIs, I think, even still talked about today as yeah. to what was going through the mind of you just, it's a, it was a druid mirror and you just keep UI. With no ramp. With yeah, no, no ramp. ramp. It's just like, that's a good card. I'm keeping it. Let's go. And it was kind of crazy. It got the job done. Yeah, and I, I remember day, like we were we were watching that essentially like because it was so close to the end of the tournament, it was the last game of the tournament. We were all crowded around backstage, players, ready yeah. to go on like for the the trophy celebration ceremony. Everyone walks up and shakes the winner's hand, so we're all just kind of mm -hmm. waiting to come up. Tom keeps UI, and I like freak out. I'm like looking around, like please, someone tell me I'm not crazy. And all the players there, one by one, like nah, I don't keep you either. Yeah, I don't keep you either. I don't keep you either. Meanwhile, Tom's on stage, just like. Scoreboard! Which one of us is the world champion, kids? 
it was kind of nutty yeah. uh, the, the way he did it. But it just means he's um, you know open to some unconventional play, and we might see that yeah, from this warrior maybe. But I doubt we're going to see plays like throwing away the quest in this matchup because you are not killing all the minions. Doesn't seem like the way you're going to win, no. What do you make of Kazakhstan's, though, just overall approach to this first surprised round? Surprised by it. Very, because very surprised by it. I don't know if you've played Hearthstone recently, guys at home. It's not the most aggressive meta we've ever seen. Maybe the slowest, to be completely honest. One and, off, yeah. And to try and take aggro decks in a meta that aggro decks don't work because they're not popular is brave, I think. And you can see it from Taiwan's reaction as well, the way the pick ban phase went. Taiwan prioritized banning away the two control yeah. decks that were available for Kazakhstan. They said, no, you can't have your quest warrior. No, you can't have your control mage. The the other seven are all the aggressive variants. If you wonder if you we keep saying that, if you're curious what priest is, by the way, we're calling inner fire priest, the aggressive sure. variant of priest. Um, and then of course they've got token druid and then they're you, like, ah, tempo priest. Yeah, right. And then you can probably figure the rest out. Um, but you know, Taiwan just essentially looked at that lineup and disrespected it, right? They said, you can have your aggro decks. We'll yeah. ban the two decks that we've been seeing other teams play so far, the Quest Warrior and the Control Mage, and you can you can have your little toys. You can play your little minions on turn one, two, and three. That's why this is playing your little minions. It's, it's like playing the piano badly, yeah. I think, more than anything. I will say I'm, I'm now... It's the spooky hands. It's the, ooh, I'm so scared hands. That's what it is. If you just made... I've, I've never seen that. Really? I've never heard you talk like that either, so I'm a little bit freaked <laughs> out. <laughs> I, it's a spooky yeah, hands. It works. Ooh, I'm so scared of the way you're talking. <sighs> anyway, I am excited after, as we come into the end of, of week one of HGG, uh, and, uh, and, and for week two, to be honest, I think that everyone will have learned a lot from week one in terms of lineups. We saw, like, oh, maybe Quest Rogue is the correct Rogue to play in this format right now. I is wonder it, if... Is it correct next week? Because then people will see Rogue's good. So then do you take more aggressive lines? I think there are lessons to be learned going into week two. Chief amongst which is the players learning how to start games quicker. Yeah, I agree. I can make them start right now. Oh. A Just. fraction off! Oh. Oh, so close. I, you, you've got to love a try, right? Yeah. Okay, let's go. KG versus Tom60229 to give him his full title and deserved title of world champion. It's going to be the Hunter versus the Warrior. Seepling Oozling. Seepling Oozling. Seepling Oozling. There we go. Uh, to be honest, for me, it wouldn't be too far away from a keep right now. The, the, the official name that of that card is uh, Flooping Floopling. <laughs> Floopy Floopington. Yeah. Oh, that was what I, that's why I want different skins for cards. Or alternate art, I guess it would be called in, in a card game. But I want like Lord Floopington the, the Flooped. And it's just got like a top hat and a monocle. It'd be great. Mm -hmm. Moving yeah. swiftly on, uh, Tom okay. does, in fact, of course, keep the Fire Plume's heart, as expected. It's not a matchup where you can exhaust. So as Raven said, the one real hope that you have is just to go kind of go Turbo Quest and then hope that you can get there with some hero powers. Um, on Kazakhstan's side, I think they're looking pretty happy with the left two cards. Yes, throwing away the Firefly because it's just not an impactful card in the matchup but instead do pick up one of their beasts, but not a bad one to draw because it does mean you can now like consistently or more consistently rip damage out of your beast activators with the uh, the Charge Devil Swords and the King Crush. Right, and Vanguard not really one you want to see in the draw as well because suddenly you, you want uh, Katrina away from, from whiffing on the Death Rattles. Right. But Howmaster Shaw does, a, I would I would say, is a stronger job in this matchup than it does in some others. Because Rush is a mechanic that is aggressive in itself in terms of opening up space for the minions already on the board to attack base. But also, Quest Warriors specifically will want to be dropping minions on the board with Taunt to stop you, but then Rush negates that because you can just kill them off straight away. Yes. And speaking of Turbo Quest, we set out the little light at the end of the tunnel for Warrior in this matchup is just getting your quest done as quickly as possible because you do have some time. Recruit Hunter is not Face Hunter, you know? It's not like they're leponoming you and then playing a Glaive Zooka and then you're dead. Uh, it's yep. it's They're going to develop minions starting turn six onwards oh, that you're going to have to deal with. So if you can get your quest counter up to three or four before Kazakhstan even get any work done, you're suddenly in business. And by the way, Taiwan roping here Oh, okay, there's actually a reconnect issue. Kazakhstan, the webcam disappeared, 
Um, but Taiwan, I think, actually had a genuine decision that turn because they had Battle Rage in their hand. Yep. I, I don't think the rope was uh, purely because of clearly the, the disconnect issue that we ran into. But with Battle Rage in their hand, there was actually a serious discussion going on about whether to armor up or not because they needed to draw some cards so they can get through to that quick quest completion. Yeah, and also a lot of the early minions in that deck, I mean, you saw it in the mulligan and it was thrown away, was just the Firefly, right? It's like, do you want to take one from Firefly? Fantastic, we'll do that. Looks like we are getting back into the game and just in case you, it's not really happened to you or you've not really seen it in action, mm -hmm. uh, the reconnect feature exists. So the game will effectively stall until someone reconnects. So that means we... The rope's back. Deja vu. Okay. I can see card movement in the upper section of the board, though, yeah. so I'm happy. But yeah, the, the reconnect feature means we, we don't have to restart the match. There's not going to be a fresh mulligan. Everything's as it was, and we're going to continue with the game now. And it looks like they're going to skip the hero power. Maybe Tom, Tom looks like he might just be telling a funny joke. He looks like his head's in the movement of a chuckle. Did they really just pull the let's rope out the turn so that they might think that we just forgot to hero power instead of didn't press it deliberately, Gambit? Because that is the worst Gambit in all of Arsenal. Oh, never mind. Worked out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so honestly, I understand it from the point of Taiwan. Are you not hero powering as the hunter in this matchup? Honestly. Let's so see how many... I, I, I very much struggle not to want two extra damage. Let's see world. how many Battle Rages Taiwan are playing. They are playing a single copy of Battle Rage. Um, so I think I think there's, a, there's an argument to it because, again, you're not dealing damage in increments of two with this deck, right? You're not going to hero power them down and that ends the game in classic Face Hunter style. You're dealing damage in increments of eight. You know, that, right. like, you're, you're making huge pushes for massive amounts of damage in the later stages of the game. Um, but, but they can add up, though, because three eights don't add up to right, 30. Right. Now, now here's, yeah, and here's the point I was going to get to. Not only that, but the hero powers add up as well, because this is a very slow hand from Kazakhstan. So if they commit to not hero powering on turn two, they also commit to not hero powering on turn three, and then possibly also not hero powering on turn five, and so on. Like, so it's, it's four to six damage that you then end up missing if you commit to never pressing that hero power. So if it was the case of just skipping two, we could have a talk about it, but it's much, much more than that. So I definitely, you know, despite making a little bit of a joke, it was not a bad play to press the hero power button. It's just funny that I, you know, Tom spent that entire opening laughing to himself as if right. he was trying to pull the gambit. And it's just kind of cute to see it work out. Kalaseth is drawn. More likely not going to be dropped this turn as Shaw is pretty nice. And, and the, the best thing about this card, and I, I did like it when it was revealed, is that he's four mana three six. It's just a sturdy it's minion. A big boy. Yeah, it's, it's just sturdy. Not yeah. many minions get even close to that stat line that also have a powerful effect. It's, for me, it's one of the very like true legendary cards. It's not super flashy, but it's just powerful. Right. I don't think Kalsath Hero Power does much here. You do need to kill these taunts at some point. I will say, though, it's very weird that Kalaseth is still powerful in a deck that you play high statted minions. Because mm -hmm. you'd imagine the higher the stats of the base minion, the less impact Ooh. plus one plus one has. Sorry. Distracted for oh. a second, Raven. I'm sure whatever you're by saying. A, by a stony hill. Wonderful. But yeah, this is a super fast quest now available for Tom60229. With the Stonehill Defender, if it can potentially pick up another cheap taunt here, then they don't even have to wait to get all the value out of Stonehill, uh, out of Phantom Militia, sorry, later in the game. But yeah, there is the big issue of that, that Houndmaster Shaw that you were just extolling the virtues of as I didn't listen to you and got distracted by the top deck Stonehill. Sorry, were you saying something? I was, actually. Okay. What's, what's do you want me to recap? No. Okay. <laughs> just trying to just go over this list. There is one deadly shot as well in the list for Kazakhstan, which means there is some sort of snap removal. One deadly shot, two hunter's marks, obviously two candle shots as well. So there is some sort of snap removal to just click, try and clear the board out to make a big minion hit. Right. So at the moment, this board is very, very wide at this point. Careful, those raptors have rush. To kill us turn now. You want to, ideally you want to get it done before you start recruiting things, right? Um, In theory. Do you know what I might use of how master though? Or just get 
CP boy out? CP boy isn't mm. dying though, so it's not like you're getting maximum no, but value you can out hit of it. and hit a two six pretty hard. Yeah, no, that is true. I guess there's uh, there's no play dead in hand, right? So it's not like you're kind of holding out for that combination. I like this. I guess I can see it, and you can still do it the other way around in theory because it's unlikely that Taiwan really want to like bust this oozling open on their own no terms unless they hand, have perfect removals. And then you can just get the Kellerseth down on, on your turns on the following turn anyway. This is a really, really fast quest, though. It feels as if Tom's almost got ramp in his warriors somehow. I don't know. I'm looking at the hands and just feel that th this recruit hunter is, is very slow with this hand. I mean, it, it doesn't it's help what that, I said, right? You have four yeah. or five turns to try and get your quest counter up to three or four while they do nothing, and Tom hit the top end of that. He got it up to four. And it definitely doesn't help when Silver Vanguard and Lich King are in your hand, right? That's just a, a lowering of power sure. to a large extent. Taiwan looking like they're considering breaking over this Oozling. They do, of course, play around the play dead kind of situation. And with the Witchwood Dr Grizzly coming down, that's pretty much perfect scenario for them because now that's very low pressure for Kazakhstan, who pick up a Charge Devil Saw in hand as well. So, does this turn into Kelaseth and Spellbreaker just because the Spellbreaker kills a 2 4? Kills a 2 4? You mean the stats on the following turn contest it? It has rush. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> an idiot. I agree. Mm. I'm just trying to think, like, what does Spellbreaker do in this matchup? Like, right. Not a lot. It Even if it silences a minion to gain an attack, well, you can kill the minion to gain the attack too, so... I think it's the best you've got. You can also put in two of the minions, and Kalaseth makes up the damage from either the Grizzly or the Howlmaster. Yeah, now I've remembered how Howlmaster short works. That play makes a lot more sense. <laughs> right. This, this is a weird choice, because this is where the, I was talking a lot early when Howmaster first came down. Is it is very good versus a deck that is trying to block you with taunts because of exactly what we've just seen. Yeah, is it good enough to draw and execute against this deck? I, I would be torn if I was Tom right now. Because if you play Taunts, yes, you get to your quest, absolutely fine. I, but they just almost guarantee you're gone, and these three now get to attack phase. I think you execute the 310, and here's my reasoning. Because Saranite Chain Gang comes down alongside that, right? And then that's 7 out of 7. And then from that point onwards, you have a couple of swings of Sulfurus to play with. That Sulfurus can swing into a 3-4 Houndmaster Shore and kill it. It can't swing anywhere if there's a 3-10 Witchwood Grizzly hanging around on the board. Okay. And you don't have to give your opponent credit for seeing for having a uh, Witchwood Grizzly number two in their hand. In fact, you suspect it's unlikely. Because Witchwood Grizzly was the minion that got pulled out from the recruit, you think that there's two in the deck, right? Because it's, it's, the, most then, it's then the most one. likely option. I am excited that if this execute goes onto the Grizzly, we're going to see the Silver Vanguard rush into a 2-3. My 7 mana just about kills your 2-3. Let's go. Yeah. Ooh, now with Play Dead available, though. Now Does that really change? Now get spicy. And that's the one thing where I feel like... It doesn't. Yeah, there's only the one minion left to pull, right? And, and this, personally, is, is why I think everyone's leaning more towards cubes again. Mm -hmm. Because with cubes, you can do some funky plays right now, you know, with, with play dead. With rec with just raw recruit hunter, you often can't do anything super powerful. Because you only have one of every minion. Yeah. Whereas cubes, like, we saw on, I think it was day one of, of this week, right? What cubing how Master Shaw does. Like, yes. all my minions have rush forever. Right. Never mind, of course, like, Devil Saws, etc. No walls can hold me. Quickly. Pushed into the four as well. This, you see how powerful Rush is, and I think it's something that's hopefully we're going to see a bit more of mm -hmm. as the exp uh, next expansion hits. I hope there's some Rush cards at least. Oh, 
like no on positioning for Garrosh as well. And also, you don't really, you're worried about what's coming out of that Vanguard. It's actually a pretty hard turn. It really is. Wait. Of course, if they go Sulfurus here, they can never really get any value out of the Scourge Lord Garrosh, which is right. probably what they're considering, but it's just so much health to give up, just equipping Garrosh here, swinging into a 4-1, potentially there's then a Lich King on your opponent's other side of the board afterwards, like, you can get into a mess. Yeah, or a 7-7. Yep. Also as well, the armor's just insignificant from Dry Whis Whisker Gulp, no, no, sorry, Dry Whisker Armor, <laughs> because it just, who cares about 6-7 A armor, right. I think that's one hit from a minion. We're gonna see. Oh, Tom, Tom's enjoying himself some, for some reason. I don't quite understand why. I'll be a little bit upset right now. But suddenly, play dead. Looks pretty good to me. Well, again, there's only one Devil Saw left in the deck, right? And King Crush. That's true, yeah. Unless you just Lich King this turn, because the Catherine is always going to pull something, because there is two in the deck, not one. Right. So you have one more turn. So maybe just Lich King this time, actually. You want to save the Devil Saw in hand now to take down an Annoying Taunt. It's not very efficient, mm. but it gets the work done. I wonder. Only three damage off lethal right now. Welp. Welp, indeed. Even Perfect World, they, what, they sell Furious, they Hero Power the 8-8, they Shield Block, and they are at 8, which is not the number you want to be at. Hmm. This is just going to be some well. Oh, they know there's a deadly shot in the deck as well. So some well, you just, you're pretty, you're kind of likely to just be dead regardless. Some well? Some well, some well is a thing. I'm aware. Okay. How How do you know some well is a thing? Because one of the cards says it, right? Is it Shadow Sun Cleric says I must protect the some well? Oh, okay, okay. Law with subtle, <laughs> it's law with subtle. It's just a much worse version of that jingle. It is. Oh, I like it. Well, this is just unnecessary. <laughs> I, I love it. That is a cute play yeah. from Team Kazakhstan there, and that is going to be a cute lethal as well. So they do even the series up, and again, we talked about it, that there's a chance for the Warrior, of course there is, but even with the quest being completed that quickly, Recruit Hunter is just too powerful in general. The minions are too big and too many is the main problem. Killing a couple of big dinosaurs is easily doable for the warrior, but not when they just come turn after turn after turn. And again, to be honest, how Master Shaw won that game, in my opinion? I would be inclined to agree. Yeah, without the how Master Shaw, there would not have been any anywhere near as much face damage pushed, which again, that sounds like a bizarre thing to say, but I think you did a, a good job of explaining early on that if you can rush minions from your hand into taunt minions, you can then push damage with the minions that you have on board. Suddenly, in the world where they have, where the warrior has 10, 15 extra health, and they got the quest done that quicker, right. that, that as quick as they did, then suddenly they get that free sulfurous turn and they can start punching back. Then we might have had a different story, but that, of course, was not the reality. It's why that matchup is so favored for the recruit hunter, and it looks like this one now, after we talked about the relative merits of a 3-0 for either side, it looks like now this one is going to go the distance. Yeah, we're going to go for another Hearthstone slobber knocker going on right now. We're going to give you two minutes just to get ready for the next game, so don't go anywhere, guys. We'll be right back. We've got Kazakhstan versus Taiwan continuing right now, and it's going to be one and one so far with the next matchup coming right up. And Naaman is going to be stepping up to the plate, the star player by a country mile, I would say, on Kazakhstan. Yes, indeed. Naaman, uh, someone that I first uh, met, I believe, in like a Gfinity major in the UK. Yep. 
Um, back then, he carried a reputation of being, you know, one of the strongest aggro players in the game, which, you know... Hunter it, players. Yeah, I mean, particularly back then. I mean, back then, ag aggro was hunter. Hunter was aggro. They were synonymous with each other because... Um, the style of aggro back then was truly aggro. You know, you had Lepanome and you had efficient burn damage and charge minions were still allowed to exist. It was, <laughs> it was, it was a wonderful time you used to be to, alive. Yeah, you used to literally play Hunter by just counting backwards from hero powers and yep. damage from Lepanomes. It was just like, okay, how many turns now? How many turns now? How many hero powers? And that was, that was the whole game. There was no oh, healing for a million or, you know, like going back up to full health, healing reigns, for example. Play, play an arcane golem on turn three, hit them in the face for four and say, enjoy your mana, idiot. That, <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was the game. Um, it, was, it was wonderful. It was a better time. Beautiful time, yeah. Beautiful but now, time. Uh, you know, we have aggro decks like Even Shaman. That's what we're calling an aggro deck these days. Where, because it plays stuff before turn five. Exactly. Where, you know, if it, if it comes up against a very resilient deck like Mali, Druid, it quite often doesn't have the teeth to get the job done as quickly as it needs to do. Uh, Corpse Taker is a very key card in the matchup. Right. If it can come down unanswered, it can then ramp up that big damage. Sea Giant, same kind of thing, be able to build that big board state. But everything else, it's just food for swipe. It's food for spreading plague. Just plays right into what the Mali Druid game plan is. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, the big ones for, for the Mali Druid side of things is they want to have enough removal to kill the corpse takers, of course, but also the flame tongues, dire wolves, just anything that creates damage from these pitiful, like tiny minions that the even chairman has. And it's super important because if you do let flame tongue live for two turns, because you don't have the correct removal or you can't get to it with a hero power, say level one spell stone, then that actually does start to stack up pretty quickly. And when there's a few extra buff cards just on top, if you fall behind early on those things, the slightly bigger threats from even Shaman can really snowball the end of the game quite suddenly. Yeah, agreed. Um, but it, it is going to be a uphill struggle from here, as we mentioned, for the even Shaman. And there's real potential of a five-game series here, the way the matchups play out. So okay. someone is essentially going to have to break serve, to uh, use a tennis term, if I can borrow it. They're going to have to win an unfavored matchup to prevent this to going to a five-game series, because the way the matchups have lined up, that it looks like where we're heading. Yeah, openings like this are definitely not bad for naming right here because one, they're on the coin, so you can coin out a two drop or just, you know, take it a little bit slow if they want. But for example, Primal Fin, then with Earthen Might, is a threat that's relatively difficult to actually clear up. That's suddenly Wrath Spellstone. Like, what is that opening? And also, that's two good removal tools for one minion, effectively, because the spell's kind of ne negligible. Here's my counter argument, though. If you are Mali Druid, if you are the Swipe Spreading Plague deck, how much do you care about a 2-5 that fills your opponent's board with a 1-1 one, one every turn? Um, Depending on your hand, maybe not too much, because you do have Spreading Plague, you do have Incredible Armor gain, but the worry is the one more buff card, right? If Flame Tongue then gets dropped down, you're like, oh, well, this is starting to stack up, and without exactly ramp into Spreading Plague, it might just be too hot to handle. And don't get me wrong, I do think Mali Druid is in a great spot in this matchup, but this is a decent opener, especially now with Corpse Taker. I think Sea Giant's the other big threat in that case as well, right? If you just yep. let your opponent's board get so far out of control with the prim unanswered Primal Fin. And there are two in the deck. Top I would so. A top out two Sea Giant, Lich King, Hagatha, Alakir. Two Argent Commanders, two Fire Elementals as well, means there is damage just from hand as a raw aspect. Yeah, it's one of the kind of quirks of Even Shaman is because you play so little card draw, um, negligible card draw, really. You have to build kind of this stable curve, which includes lots of four drops, lots of six drops, and quite a few eight drops as well, because otherwise you're just going to run out of value. And that, what that does is it leads you into worlds where you get kind of awkward opening hands, like you see here from Naaman. Like, they're all great cards in isolation, apart from the Gen, but it's not a smooth curve moving forward. It's not like a consistent chain of threats. Right. But that Sea Giant might help out because now that one turn they might miss here might just be able to be filled with the Sea Giant the way this Primal Fin is going to work out. Yeah, and one thing about the coin usage there, you know, it was the first play instantly I talked about of coin Primal Fin into Earthen Might. There was also a slightly slower option 
of Hero Power, turn two Primal Fin, turn three Coin Corpse Taker, then put Earthen Might on the Corpse Taker sure. and say, I am going to, you know, make this one minion really be a one, a huge threat, mm -hmm. and two, get, get a lot of damage to face stone. Now, Naaman did choose to just go with the sort of initial play, and I think it's still okay, but I definitely would have considered that Corpse Taker play with a coin. Yeah, I, th I wouldn't be surprised if there was a discussion between Naaman and his teammates about it, but I think... When you when you break it down, like in that world, this primal fin's already pushed four damage before you would have played the corpse taker, for example. So you're making up a lot and of the damage immediately that you quote lose from the corpse taker win fury play. You're also one naturalizer away from a bad time, right? Exactly. You are one naturalizer, or even just hero power, spell stone, or all kinds of things are able to take it out. It's not a very sticky minion the turn it comes down. It really is a lot of the time. Play it, cross your fingers, and then if it lives, that's when you can really start to send it out of control. But the turn it comes down, it is quite easy to deal with for a lot of decks in the meta game right now. Yep. I do think there's also just slight levels of pause on how many times you actually want to press that buffed hero power in this matchup. Mm -hmm. Because the second you have four totems on the board and you don't have a buff card, yeah. Druid's like, Okay, right. <laughs> let's do this and just pass every turn until they have 10 cards and then you die. Right. I think with Sea Giant in hand, then it becomes a little more straightforward. You do just want to get as many minions on board as you can yeah, just to make sure that you can get that Sea Giant down. Maybe turn five is when you're looking for it. But yes, totems are a concern, especially in matchups where you're trying to be so aggressive. You don't want to fill your board with just a bunch of nonsense and then the opponent can just essentially ignore it and just right. say well okay you've got you know you've got seven minions no, seven minions no. in play but they hit me for a combined total of four damage why do i care yeah you and three with hero power yeah. you know like you could just reduce so much of it and when druid can just gain armor out of nowhere and so much armor you can just sit and probably just pass every turn and only play armor gain cards and win the game let's see Faceless the Primal Fin Totem. Thoughts, concerns. It's not really playing around Sea Giant, is it? Not particularly. No. <laughs> I mean, I I definitely understand the point because that's just an awkward threat that this deck isn't really equipped to deal with right now. Just a two five spewing one ones. Yeah. But it's how much of you well you don't have an answer to a Sea Giant, and then you actually might die. Already, to be honest, Taiwan is struggling a tiny bit because. There isn't ramp and there isn't card draw ramp. Yeah, innovates there, but there isn't the the hard ramp. If they hit a wild growth. They've got an innovate in their hand. How greedy are you? Nourish. Okay. <laughs> and uh, but there's no card draw to back it up. The whole idea is nourish into ultimate infestation yep. or even ferocious howls or you know Malfurion to buy more time. But none of that exists right now. This is a pretty awkward turn though for Kazakhstan. Because they want to just drop Corpse Taker. They want that huge threat online. They want to be able to start getting rolling with, with minions that do a significant amount more damage. But that leaves them in a world where dealing with this Arcane Tyrant is just not a, not a happy time for them whatsoever. Time. So now that you've got the healing totem, do you want to preserve your full board state here and just uh, not trade off the 1-1s? One trade with the 2-5 instead? Or is it just too much value long term? Yo. Um, I think you're going to be okay for space regardless, right? So th this Primal Fin is going to regenerate the 1-1s one really quick. So I, I, I like keeping the 2-5 the on. It, it just dodges the Spellstone, right? You know they don't have the armor to proc a Spellstone right now. Nourish to draw. That Nourish pickup was huge as well. <laughs> If that was any non-draw card, this game becomes very dicey very quickly. I think, though, when you're playing against Mali Druid, any time you force them to use Nourish to draw cards, you have to consider that a win, because that's not how they want to be using yeah. it. I've made this point before, Let's but, you know, see. five mana draw three cards is not a card you would play in your deck. The intention is to use it to ramp so that you get to ultimate infestation quicker. So the fact that uh, Roger was forced to do it there has to be considered a win for Naaman, I think. And that's also a win for name as well when you spellstone a free zero two or oh, one mana zero two sure, but not a card in your deck. It's pretty huge. My worry is if you don't play Corpse Taker again this turn, are you ever playing Corpse Taker? I mean, they're playing Corpse Taker this turn. I, I can't imagine a world where that doesn't happen.
does set up for the Flame Tongue the turn after to just potentially win the game, depending on what's going on. Because they don't have a great turn six right now. They have Sea Giant sometimes if the board doesn't get addressed. They actually have Sea Giant a lot of the time if they go Corpse Taker into Hero Power, just because it's very unlikely that Druid is able to uh, clear that much off of right. the board. But they don't really want to be playing Gen on turn six. So having some kind of play with uh, Flame Tongue on your Corpse Taker plus whatever they draw off the top is looking pretty appealing to me right now. Also as well, it it kind of beats a Spreading Plague as well as you can beat a Spreading Plague because you can buff the Corpse Taker to five and then you get two trades because of the Wind Fury as well. So you can take down two taunts for the price of one. So yeah, it's a nice setup. There skipping the totem here obviously to play around spreading plague to an extent now some cards have been drawn it's a little worrying because now if two minions are taken off the board that sea giant goes to seven so naturalize for example they don't get to play sea giant next turn ever because naturalize happens and then the twig will kill a one one and the sea giants back up to seven but i guess in that world you've been naturalized so you're finding a play on the next turn anyway you have Gen worst case scenario, and also what this does is keep space that if Taiwan, um, if they spread in plague and don't do anything else, then Flame Tongue and the Giant can come down. Sure. Let's see. Which that's a very very powerful turn. Is it though? You don't get much of a conga line. It's not like you really get to trade through many of the spreading plagues. Well, you get two just for the corpse taker, right? Right, but then that's it. It stops. Right, but like for example, the the mud spark and the one one kill another one, so it's it's not it's not fantastic, but it's not terrible. And you've played some power minions onto the board. Okay. Spellstone and a moon fire. Taiwan really do not want to use naturalize on that thing. They do not. Earthen Might is somewhat useful here, as is Flame Tongue, in that it allows them to trade through this Corpse Taker with only two attacks instead of three, which of course net heals Taiwan for less in the process, but it does get them slightly awkward. No, it's still fine. They can get a good Sea Giant turn out of it anyway. If they do it with Flame Tongue Totem instead of Earthen Might, it's all perfectly fine. Next turn for Taiwan, though, is absolutely savage. They can innovate Alex Straza, swing the weapon, ultimate infestation. Yep. Woo. And again, there is there was a free totem turned down there from Kazakhstan. It's not that they missed it, it's just they don't want that extra one mana totem on board. They could have pressed a totem for one, which of course discount Sea Giant for one, so it's essentially always free in that scenario, but no real reason to especially with the threat of that card that you see drawn on the right hand side, spreading plague picked up. Yeah, this turn probably looks slightly different to what I suggested now, is you can spread in Plague, kill the 3-1, then play UI on, say, Flame Tongue Dawn. How about... Which is weird, then. Do you, do you not kill the 3-1? It's kind of odd, right? Because you might say, well, it's something too damage, but they don't have a ton of health, even after the UI. Right. So... <laughs> Maybe you're just saying he can have a 1-1 one, one and I'll go face just to prop the weapon. It's still May maybe you out. play Alex Straza instead and play UI next turn. I... Hmm. Can Alex Straza naturalize, right? You do that anyway, Mr. right? Naturalize yeah, 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 yeah. You're naturalizing before the weapon goes off. All right. Never mind. Apparently, you're not. That was not great. But the, I believe they let the rope burn out. Because they have a second tyrant, right? Yep. They could have missed the, uh, missed the trick on that one. Didn't end up drawing it. And didn't end up naturalizing a sea giant either. Which is somewhat bizarre to me. This turn, I imagine, is just setting up as good a Hagatha as possible. Hmm. What to do? Which means, on paper, three of these 1-5s die next turn. Or by the end of next turn, at least. I 
This is awkward though, because it's getting to the point where if you plan on Hagatha, you don't really want to play too many more minions because you want the power after like, exactly. the post Hagatha box. Yeah. I mean, now is the time where you have to be kind of formulating some plan B because your plan A is clearly not working out. Yeah. Druid has the Spreading Plague in play. They just UI'd, so they have just about every option that they want to in hand right now. So, yeah, there's not really a great deal that you can do except try and fall back on some kind of Hag Hagatha miracle or Lich King miracle. And now, welcome to Mali Druid. You draw your deck so often that in turns like this, you just do what you want. Like, you are in full control right now. Yeah. And it is glorious. I've just come off the, the end of what I will say is like a, a Mali Druid kick. And uh, it, this is why I love the deck. You, you just have cards. You have options. You have choices. And a lot of the time... Every single card you use has a high impact on whether you win that game or not. There's not really any throwaway cards in this deck. My question here is, can Taiwan immediately go on the yeah. offensive? Because they have nine damage in play here maximum. They have Alexstrasza and Naturalize available to them, and they have Swipe on the follow-up on the following turn, or Ultimate Infestation on the following turn. In the words of Admirable, giddy up. That's what Roger's leaning towards. Alex Strauss, I do like it. Naturalize the Sea Giant. The deck is very, very good at flipping the switch, especially because this even shaman does not have an answer to a turn this aggressive. Right. What do they do? Press hero power again? Right. Like, it's not going to do anything at this point. The naturalized being, I would say, like, held for a very long time. But getting the job done right now, and suddenly, seven health. Naaman has to clear this board just to not die next turn. He sure does. Because for all he knows as well, there is still just, even if one minion lives, there's UI Moonfire, for example, because only one Moonfire has been used so far. Yep. Hagatha does take him up to 12 here, which is good news. And also the way it lines up, it allows the 6-2 uh, the to trade into the 8-5. So it's only the ghoul that remains. Leaving Taiwan with 10 from hand now, currently. Oof. Only if it was the star. Only fire. it was the other star. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. As we did as it, it so was drawn. In, in the previous series, uh, the the Mali Druid played in that series had Starfall, and personally, not a fan. I I'm in love with Starfire right now. Wait, is that lethal? It's eleven. Oh. Can't hear a pound now anymore. Warriors of the frozen. Lich King's pretty lethal, though. There's going to have to be some real oh. magic coming out from this Hagatha. And Death and Decay as well. He's just beautiful. Just extra damage from Lich King is insane in this deck. Because you already have a lot of damage you can aim at face. Yep. Why not three more? I mean, there's no way to even kill the Lich King, right? Mm -hmm. You either you just play a taunt and cross your fingers. I think you start playing cheap minions and cross your fingers that way. It's probably a higher outcome based on how many cards that Team Taiwan have drawn now. Yep. It's just likely that there's damage. I'm not even talking about the Lich King Death and Decay here. There's still UI. There's still swipes. Perplexing. There's still Moonfire. It's just... Branching Pass if they leave them... If, if Kazakhstan have to leave a minion live, Branching Pass just gets the job done too. It's difficult to even imagine a combination of spells that gets them out of this, though. Even with perfect rolls, they need some kind of board lockout, some kind of removal, plus a massive amount of healing. Mud Spark, Cryostasis, Cross Fingers for healing rain next turn. Cryostasis? Just to freeze, to do this, basically. Avalanche. Cryostasis is the buff thing, right? Right, it still freezes the minion. Okay. I'm just saying, I'm just thinking of spells that can stop the Lich King attacking right now. Not that it matters. Taiwan take the win, and again, we 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 kind of outlined how this matchup generally goes, but the Maligos Druid just proving how powerful it is, and for me at least at all, I am surprised it has got through in this tournament as often as it has. Like, we've seen a lot of Maligos Druid, and I'm, I'm surprised Wait, Druid... Is that true? We've seen two today. That's two hundred percent Today, yeah. Hasn't yeah, it been consistently banned throughout, apart from today? I think we've seen, I think we've seen more Mali. Okay. Mali Druid. We'll, 
We'll get you the numbers ready for next week. Yeah. I'm very interested in the, the pick rates and ban rates of every class right now because cause the format's so new to all the players. I'm very interested to see what in the wider scope of things across all 48 countries as to what their approach has been. As we see Kazakhstan's taken a bit of a different one, but it's not working out too well now. Yeah, I mean, I think thinking back, we, we of course saw that Mali Druid game for Norway uh, against the yep. Control Mage. But outside of that, I don't remember seeing it too okay. often. I think maybe, it was, maybe I'm was, just was banned out quite often along the way. But we as, as time went on, we saw the ban shifting to kind of Miracle Rogues, Quest Rogues, Recruit Hunters, those, right. those kinds of things. It's just we're in a very different world here because Kazakhstan have had such a unique twist on the meta game where they brought so many more aggressive decks that they felt like they can leave Mali Druid up and there's more resilient. You know, they have to take care of Quest Warrior, for example, yeah. just because it's such a stable anti-aggro deck against the kind of stuff that they have. Yeah. Let's take a look at what the next matchup is going to be and see if Taiwan can actually clean this one up in a 3-1 fashion. They have Hunter versus Paladin. Let's just take a look at <laughs> I just naturally went for Taiwan's list because it's the one that the hunter's being played from. I have, to, I have a Kazakhstan right in front of me and I ignored it, but Paladin is almost certainly odd, I believe, yep. because why wouldn't it be in any other reasonable world? And the hunter is going to be the cube hunter for Taiwan, and this is a deck I cannot wait to watch. It's a deck I'm currently uh, putting a bit more time, invested a bit more time into for some of the intricate plays, but I'm excited about this one. Any I don't think there's anything too crazy, although there's no King Crush. Hmm. That is a bit crazy. Two Grizzlies instead. Okay. Two Grizzlies, two Savannah High Main, so it's a yeah. little bit more uh, anti-aggro than the, the, the King Crush variation. One Tar which... Creeper, two Defender of Art. This matchup might actually be hard for the Paladin right now. I think that might be taking it a bit far. It would definitely be better for the Hunter, I'm sure. But in Tar Creeper, two Defender of Art, All right. two Flanking All right, shot. last question. Saranite Chain Gang. Is there a Prince Keleseth in there? Yes. Okay. Then I think the Paladin will do all right. What were you, what were you thinking? Well, it means about? they're not playing Pyromancer. Sure, 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 sure. Um, I don't know. I mean, that you're listing a lot of defensive tools. It's definitely going to be pa better than what we see as like the surface level we... version of the, the, the cube hunter that we see on ladder most of the time. Okay, Void Ripper is going to be very important because the double witch with Grizzly as well. Paladin doesn't really run an answer to that. It's kind of a weird world to live in, though, where you're like saying, oh, Void Rippers are useful card to have against the 0-3 egg deck and so uh, you can definitely yeah, get yourself into a mess it's just it's an awkward deck to deal with like i said there's there's the saranite chain gang in there as well so yeah. there's just a lot of early taunts and paladin great value deck it just never really ends but there's also just so much high health taunt minions available mm. It's a little bit scary, I think. There's no owls either in the list, so there's no chance of sort of just cheating away a grizzly and just saying, oh, actually, this 12 health doesn't matter. Yeah, I think if uh, the hunter can get off to a decent start, pick up maybe uh, Firefly and Candleshot in the opening hand, yes. then they can be in a very big posi uh, good position because primarily before... before well, If you're not playing you know, Tar Creepers, Def Defender of Argus, all those cards that you described... Paladin can kind of go through a candle shot firefly opening and just still be fine and just yes. march on forwards and then then they're going to land their level up and they're going to end the game. Because they just go too wide, right? Yeah, There's still exactly. only so many ways you can swing a candle shot every right. turn. Yeah, but if you do get into that position where you know your first couple of press the button turns are being dealt with with a firefly and a candle shot, then I can see you know Devil Saw Egg into something into Defender of Argus into Tar Creeper into Witchwood Grizzly. I can see that being too much as long as they can deal with the first few turns. So I think that's what's going yeah, to be The game can definitely be uh, be stolen away in the in the early side for the Paladin. I will say as well, flanking shot is actually pretty decent because the whole removal and make the minion that's powerful versus the Paladin because it's a three three. Yeah, it like just kills almost every card they have in the deck right. at some level. So flanking shot a nice uh, option there as well for the hunter. The players are just getting ready, making sure they're good for the next game again. The players are all playing together on a. Uh, they are allowed to communicate over however way they want even carrier pigeons might be a bit slow but they could try it but yeah they do just have to switch accounts as the pilot does change uh, almost every game but we can see there how the game's been going so far will we even get to the last play possible play game so I i'm feeling hunter i mean okay we will wait and see and it seems that we do not have to wait much longer because i believe the players are just about to get into this game and there is the firefly and the devil saw egg that we mentioned might be crucial, but the Void Ripper pickup 
is pretty key as well. And there is a ton of damage able to come through with that Diamol Blessing and Might combination. So both teams picking up fairly strong openers here. This is a great dynamic between those two three cost cards. <laughs> I don't know if you can keep the Devil Star Egg in this matchup, but it would be really funny if like, oh yeah, I've, I've got some Void Ripper tech. Wait, wait, tech to beat the tech card? Yes, I played Devil Star Egg, let's go. Do you think Firefly is going to be fantastic right now, though? It's a bit of a tough mulligan. It's something I was talking to a little bit earlier as well. I I'm not super polished up on the mulligan for, for this Hunter list sure. in every matchup. And it I feel like it's always tough because you've got to ask yourself, with double Defender of Argus or even having Flanking Strike right there, there's a chance you throw it away and, and you get Katrina, which is, you know, that's eight turns down the line. It's a long time to wait. Yeah. Or you could have a card you can literally play guaranteed on turn four. We do see Taiwan, though, keeping the egg, keeping the fire fight, of course, but taking away the flanking yeah, shot. And they I got rewarded to high heaven. Oh, Oof. boy. Raven, you may have been right. It Dark might Reaper. be hunter time. Uh, but I definitely agree with keeping the egg. I think egg is crucial in pretty much every... I, I can't think of a matchup off the top of my head where I'd be throwing away Devil's Hour Egg in this, in this uh, deck because it's just so... Powerful. There's so many cards in your deck where if you throw away a Devil Saw Egg and then suddenly you, you draw like four to six cards in your deck that don't do anything until like turn seven. I think especially when you're playing double Defender of right, Argus. Because exactly. like, some lists don't run any Argus, right. but this one's running double all, Defender. Yeah, all the Death Rattle activators, Defender of Argus, like it's just yeah. too many tools that will just be dead if you can't put that Devil Saw Egg down on the board on turn three. Right. But combining that with Firefly and Candle Shot, this is the nightmare scenario for Kazakhstan that I described. And actually, I caught out of the corner of my eye just after I said that. They queued up their test game, and Taiwan actually got Firefly Candle Shot in the test oh, really? game <laughs> as well. Which they probably would have been looking at that, thinking, well, we've just ruined our perfect draw here. Now we're not going to get it next time. But they picked it up again off the second. Is there a better opening hand? Uh, no. No. I. I even with Kalasath in the deck, I don't think there is. It's it's actually kind of incredible at this point. The, I will say the double mole is a nice anti, you know, anti Firefly, anti uh, uh, Candle Shot sort of opening. Yep. But you still get to swing those min, you know, into those minions. That the attacks can still happen. Right. Tar Creeper, Devil Sore. Tar Creeper is a pain to deal with most of the time, but when you're backing it up with Defender Vargas and Egg, and also, most importantly, in a deck like this, the draw, they're drawing the deck in the correct order in terms of curve as well. They've not been stung yet. I'm very engrossed in this decision. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I marginally prefer putting both of them down to two, because then if your opponent's going to have a buff turn, which quite often they are, Quite often, if Old Paladin coins out two one-drops on turn one, it's because they're looking to land a buff on turn two. They're looking to go super aggressive and not planning on pressing the button too much on turn two. So by leaving one as a 1-1 one, one and one as a 1-3, you give your opponent the option mm. of buffing a 1-3, and then it's right. awkward for you to deal with. Whereas if you set them both as 1-2s, you have a plan for dealing with whichever minion they want to buff on the following turn. I just see Devil Sarag winking at us. <laughs> oh, point, to be honest. So now, if you're Kazakhstan, after you've seen how powerful this response was from Taiwan, I was going to say, I don't think you're even ahead enough on the board right now to go all in on that big Blessing of Might push, because Candle Shot just clears it up all immediately and does anyway. does even take damage as well. This is when you know that there's a certain level of confidence and control, is when you have Tar Creeper against Paladin, and you choose to play a 0-3 zero zero without Taunt versus them. Obviously, there's the Argus, which helps. But when they're not under enough pressure to press Tar Creeper on 3, they could have just Tar Creeper on 3, egged on 4, yeah. and then gone Argus. But nope, they're like, eh, all the time in the world. Don't you worry. It's fine. And then just Terra Scale to actually put a threat on the board afterwards if the egg is ignored and... and Team Kazakhstan trying to maybe build a, a board up before they deal with the egg into the 5-5. I mean, right now they have to 
buff their board and commit all of that damage just to break open a Devil Saw egg to play right, around, right. Like, you know, Terra Scale Stalker and play dead. Like, that's a miserable proposition for the aggro deck. I, do, I think in this position, if you're going to respect that Devil Saw egg, you're fighting a losing battle with the aggro deck in the matchup. There are positions when you can do it, don't get me wrong. Because one five five isolated on the board doesn't matter too much a lot of the time. And they are actually gonna go ahead and go for they it. Do have the divine shield which makes it slightly safer and a raid leader and blessing of might follow up. Sure. Means it's reasonably likely, but now do you Okay. Have have a have a, have a tar creeper. Yeah. Cause now you kind of weirdly want the five five not taunted while these divine shields are alive. Yeah, absolutely. So you're just like, well. Take the Divine Shields off them both, I would say. Tar Creeper. And then, even with buffs, they're still probably going to kill themselves off. Right. I do wonder where Taiwan choose to allocate their damage here, because uh, the Candle Shot is a very valuable resource. Of course, you can ping off a Divine Shield here, which is great, but this is five damage they're looking at. They haven't done anything yet, though. So, yeah, it's five, but it puts them to 25. I'd love... I would love it if they went to the double divine shield because also they, there is zero chance of the big five turn uh, turn five play. No fungal mancer, no level up available. I not that there's level can, up minions. I guess I definitely don't like killing both of the divine shields there. I, oh, really? I think yeah, killing one minion is the option versus going face. I was just worried about the buffs getting a double trade off. I, we we can see this bless the might in hand of course, but. Now, the decision to pop open that egg has seemed to be very important for Kazakhstan now that you look at the way the game's played out because they're stuck, our Taiwan, with just a handful of activators that are completely useless. Bit of a free tip, it's almost always correct to kill an egg if you can. Because it, the 5-5 five five looks kind of scary, but at least it is just a 5-5 five five and not endless 5-5s. Five This is a little bit wonky right now. It's just an awful hand at this point. Yeah. Again, it goes right back to the argument of like why I would keep the egg in almost every matchup because you draw these cards very consistently. Not this many, of course. This is this has reached ridiculous points for Taiwan at this point. They've drawn an egg activator every single turn. And this is also the three. heaviest you can build the deck to right. work with the egg as well. Like I said, there are lots of versions of this list that don't run any Defender Vargas. Yep. So these could be two completely different, maybe even playable cards. Yeah. looking like very quickly even through the perfect curve one two three for the cube hunter that taiwan are going to run out of time sooner rather than later because this is just going to snowball worse and worse and worse from this position they've lost a handle on the recruits they aren't even able to deal with them as they come out now and now eventually level up is going to get drawn once a board of these one ones is built up It's going to need to be, what, Deathstalker Rexar off the top next turn to prevent it from being a huge blowout. Yeah, double Terra Scale is still just Let two three threes, see. which can get some level of work done. It's definitely not what you want them to do, but at least they can drop more than one minion a turn, which is important. But yes, Rexar is the, the get-out-of-jail-free card to a certain extent. I think it's some serious blue sky thinking to think that dropping a couple of three mana three threes is going to get anything oh, done at all oh, versus yeah. the board state they're going to be looking at. It's better than Argus Hero Power. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> Can't dispute that. That is some mighty fine reasoning. I must move quickly. Handle it. Train through the Argus. Three minions left in play. Three recruits left in play for the level up on the following turn now if they want it alongside that Corridor Creeper, which is going to get discounted to one. And that doesn't look too much like Deathstalker Rexar to me. 
You're looking through Rexar's sights, though. So there is a link. Sure. But no, it will not kill this boat, unfortunately, for uh, Team Taiwan. Your weakness betrays you. Your weakness betrays you. And I think that was the moment. You saw the little excited jiggle up and down from Limonadic uh, on the uh, the webcam for Kazakhstan as a play happened that was not Deathstalker Rexar because look how vulnerable their board state was. They knew this was the turn they had to dodge it. It happened and now they're in a position where level up is fantastic for them if they Let want it. But it is good. those three threes, having said that they're not going to do a great deal, are at least a somewhat frustrating roadblock here. But they don't care too much. Right, this is just a lot of damage at this point. Does this mean they can kill two of the, the dudes off now, especially they have Taunt. They have the three health lined up pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> just what this hand needed, another another egg activator, just to tie it together really nicely. It's a bit much, isn't it? The, problem, the frustration here as well is, with if that raid leader didn't exist, the Argus actually does some fantastic work this turn. But the raid leader makes it so stupid and awkward. That's true. That, actually, yeah. that Taiwan just can't. It doesn't do anything. It's just a four mana two three. Yeah. I don't think there's ever a world where raid uh, defender of Argus pass is a thing either. It does. It can only do worse than killing two, the two four threes, right? Yep. I wonder. It's the question of whether you're just playing it this turn just to have a two three on the board. Yeah. That's that's basically it. It's a really lame question. I lose quickly. I wonder. To which the answer is apparently yes. Mind Favor not going to be doing a great deal of work here. It's one thing they are doing right, right playing around Divine Favor. <laughs> yeah. Fight. Also, as well, the Righteous Protector makes just this even worse. Maybe this couldn't get worse, but it means that, that this deck doesn't really have good ways to kill that Divine Shield and then through the Taunt because they're all like big chunky minions mainly. Mm -hmm. So I think this is just the uh, final nail in the coffin. For this game, at least, and even, you know, against my own hopes, and not because I have favorites in this, unless it's Korea, um, but I did think the Hunter had a chance. Just quickly, though, I'm pretty sure there's 3-1 trades into the 2-3, right? Yes. <laughs> Deathstalker Rexar is the only out off the top. That trade sets you up better against Deathstalker Rexar, because then in Deathstalker Rexar world, you have a 4-1 and a 1-1 left on the board, or a 3-1 and a 1-1, I should say, since the raid leader dies, and then you have a perfect Fungal Mancer turn on the turn after. So even in a pretty locked up and one position, Kazakhstan still make the right decisions in terms of how to maximize their percentages. We expect no less with a man that we hailed his aggro skills earlier, Naaman leading the team. But they are, as we suspected, as soon as it went to 1-1, it was very likely that it was going to go all the way to a 3-2, just the way that the matchups were generated. Yeah, and I do want a, a rain check on that matchup in terms of that list versus that list, because that was one of the worst draws I, I think it was, was also good. one of the best draws it, though yes Which, it was like comes out in the wash to like a fairly average draw right because they had okay. everything they needed up until turn four and then it was one good play of just hey i'm just gonna break open this egg and leave that five right. five there and the whole deck just fell apart as it is wont to do yeah one of the worst draws <laughs> That is going to even up the series two and two. That's one more game is left. But before we get into that, we're just going to let the players get ready and go to a quick break. So don't go anywhere, guys. We'll be right back. Got the final game of this series and the final game of this week on stream. It's going to be Kazakhstan versus Taiwan, and it's all even at two and two. Which is the last two decks left? What are these other? They are Zoo for Kazakhstan. Zoo, <laughs> Zoo uh, versus the Miracle Rogue from Taiwan. It's a sprint variation of the Miracle Rogue with, as well, a mossy horror thrown in there. Which, how useful is that against this Zoo deck that we see these days? Because there's a lot of three power in there, yeah. right? In particular. Yeah, not very. 
Okay. Is my pretty straightforward answer. Uh, Mossy Horror was really just first kicked off in Rogue. Um, I did see Navi playing. It was the first player I saw uh, in, in in recent uh, past, and it was mainly to just beat Spreading Plague to really just dump on Druid, to be honest, because he's Spreading Plague, and what Druid has to do to play around that is Spreading Plague, Branching Pass, Double Attack. And that's a big ask to play around a tech card that might be there. Obviously a little bit different in a tournament setting because you know it's there because mm -hmm. the deck lists are open. But on ladder especially, like, no one really makes that play to beat that card. And sure. It does just open. Imagine the, the turn you do it on, the rogue has a board because you've just spread and played. And then they just delete that and then kill you normally. So I'm not going to do too much in this matchup, I believe. And Kind of a funny zoo list as well. So a few different cards you might not see in the standard. Is this just an Injured Blade Master? I really like Injured Blade Master in this list. It, I, I tried it out for a few games and it was just one of, to me, it was just one of those, yeah, why wasn't this card in can, here the whole I time? Can I guess why? Go on. Because the multiple la layers of heals stack and get it all the way up to the health anyway. Yeah, I mean, sure. Like, no, right. Because a lot of time you heal for one, and then you heal for, like, you might have a board heal and heal one minion for one, whereas this is always going to receive healing. And it's also just a situation of, like, this deck plays a lot of just really kind of janky, weak cards when stuff doesn't work. You know, like, sometimes you just have to play a Happy Ghoul as a 3-3, and it yeah. just ends up on the board. So just playing a 3-mana 4-3 isn't the end of the world anyway. You've kind of accepted that as the cost of entry when you're playing this deck, that sometimes you're going to have to play some janky nonsense on the board. So having an Injured Blade Master that you just play as a 4-3 on turn 3 is sometimes just fine. And then from there, it just like it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger for the rest of the game while trading in the matchups where you need it to trade or pushing 4 in the matchups where you need it to push 4. Yeah, and speaking of bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, or maybe just bigger, Prince Kalaseth is in hand ready to go and that has an it look Prince Carlsef is using Shudderwalk decks, you know, it is it's used in the Fane Death Hunter uh, what Fane Death throwback casual coming there. Yeah. Death Rattle Hunter, some decks like that. But in Zoo and in the early board focused aggressive decks, I feel like it has its highest impact by far. All of these minions should not be allowed one health. They should not be allowed one extra attack. A flame imp should not be a four three is that's just quite ridiculous, but it happens. And when it happens right now, it, it's going to be a tough one because Rogue is one where you can maybe just edge that extra aggression out and just go too fast for the Rogue to keep up. Funnily enough, no coin, Kelseth. Yeah, they went extremely common turn. Right, they went Voidwalker because they want to start laying down a board against what they expect Rogue to do on turn two, which is just dagger up and a lot of the time pass. If they don't have a prep play, if they don't have a backstab available, then they're just going to dagger and pass. But because the cold blood is in hand here, this actually ends up being quite a big punish, even potentially for the Void Walker, because at least the Keleseth would have pulled a backstab out of the hand to deal with the Keleseth if the same play was going to happen. Yeah, this is worrisome now because Coin Blade Master would kind of play around this hand that we can see because backstab doesn't work. Sure. But y there are only so many turns you can go without playing Kelaseth in this deck. Is I would have probably just automatically snapped it turn one anyway with the coin. Oh, GG. Pack it up. It's bedtime, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Breakfast time first. Thank you. But yes, you go all in here. Druid, uh, sorry. I just think I'm just used to saying Druid. Zoo has no answer to this turn. The answer is not in the deck. They're one turn away from a Spellbreaker. You're going deep with prep? Good question. Uh, yes, probably. And now that you ask it, I'm somewhat concerned about, like, you know, drawing a, a Shiv or a Fan of Knives off the top. And, like, I'd rather prep that and have myself a, a rebuy at picking up another minion, a, a Faldori Strider, another three drop. But I think if you break it down, an 8 8 does actually increase your clock by one turn a lot of the time. Right. Um, and having the 8 8 is it it also sometimes trades through one more minion if you need it to um just because of the size of the minions that zoo has so i think it comes out of the wash of being worth it to go for the it, prep in that spot d is that not slightly backwards though because uh, kels has been played so it doesn't trade through two normally because a lot of the minions are three sure. attack no it's it's a good point it's a, it's uh, a small but point but yeah in in the immediacy you're dealing with the minions that they've had in their hand already yes. right so potentially it can also, Shroom Brewer in this list as well. Another, maybe, you know, 
when Blame Master I mean, that's, that's, that's the curve. Yeah, exactly. And Troon right. Brewer high five. Yeah. Something quite nice happens. So, definitely a cool version of the list. And also with some of the aggressive cards we've seen so far of Boomstick Project, Zoo, Zoo might be really on its way back soon. I don't, wow. know who, I don't know who's popping off Mill right now. <laughs> yeah, I feel like this is some kind of weird competition. I don't know whether to cast the game or the camera versus my view of you right now, Saul. Wow. <laughs> I want listenings. Even though I wouldn't be able to understand it. Get wrecked, Kazakhstan. That's what's coming out from Taiwan uh, right now. I thought translation was... Pogchamp, 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 Pogchamp. Translation, you that. have got your mulch well and truly munched. <laughs> you win this time. One of the quickest games of the global game so far. Taiwan take the win. And that game was incredible. Keliseth available. One drops available. A massive Van Cleef also available. Ended the game pretty quick. The glare in Naaman's eyes as the camera just cut away from him is going to give me nightmares <laughs> this morning. He is already, he already looks like the evil genius of Hearthstone. There's no one else in Hearthstone that looks, that would Has look the, quite at home yeah, yeah. just stroking in a, stroking a cat and revolving in their chair as Naaman would. Again, we've like got to hang out with Naaman a few times. Like a lot of times, you know, we've just been like bantering with him or something. And I've like, I would have like made some joke, made a comment, like, vaguely insulting comment a lot of the that, time that does not sound as like i have you. been known to do uh, like Naaman just looks like he wants to murder you when you do that but the key is he looks like he wants to murder you all the time yes. he's actually quite a laid-back easy he's actually guy. a really chill guy to hang out with and it is just funny the way he always looks dangerous but yeah he did not look pleased at the end of that series again i mean when does he ever but it was can't blame him though it was literally perfect Firefly into Firefly Coldblood took the board early right. and then backstab, backstab, prep Edwin. Like the only way that turn got better if there was a spell to prep and that's just impossible because that was the maximum no number more cards, of cards in their yeah. hand. Like, huh. Let's take a look at the series. Snowdrop taking a loss to the Shudder Watch Shame, which I feel like was maybe the weak point here in this matchup for Kazakhstan. I feel like that is one that you you have it you feel you have a good chance of actually just taking. It felt it feels like I said when the game was one one, I think, you know, someone's gonna have to break serve here to prevent this from going to a three two. I think, you know, if Kazakhstan wanted to come out with the series, that was maybe where they had to right. break serve. It was, you know, the the most winnable matchup from the side that ended up losing based on the way things panned out. Yeah, and then we saw the absolute juggernaut matchup of the uh, Recruit Hunter versus the Taunt Warrior and just the inevitability of realistically how that matchup goes. Yep, and then moving on, we just saw a very similar thing from the other side was just Mali Druid just has way too much survivability. I think Naaman and Kazakhstan did a good job of ramping up the pressure for as yeah. long as they could. They got close. But then there's just that one big swing turn. And then speaking of one big swing turn, it was when uh, Kazakhstan chose to break open that egg and Taiwan's hand just completely fell apart from that point because they drew every single egg activator in their deck pretty much. Playdead was there, Argus's were there, Terra Scale Stalkers were there. And then you saw it, and well, you might have seen it, but if you blinked, you will have missed it. If you'd gone to the kitchen to get yourself a drink, you definitely would have missed it. That's what the break's for. Don't don't use the game time that's, that's for, that's for that's grabbing that's a drink. That's, that's what the break's for, guys. That's You'll miss games like this. Yeah. But I will say again, just a tiny pro tip from Raven about this. Uh, what's going to only get more popular, I think, the in the form of the Death Rattle Hunter. Kill the egg if you can, if you're against it. K kill it. Even if it looks bad and you're going to get hit for five next turn, kill it. Yeah. It's only going to get worse if you don't. Recapping the series once again, this one did really come down to the wire. It was uh, looking like this Shadowwalk Ham might just run out of removal, be one removal short towards the end of the game. But then there was a key hex pickup from Taiwan on a uh, closing turn and then a good recognition that they didn't need to use that hex immediately, right. which then set them up for their eventual win condition. They actually got lethal without Shudderwalk in that match, which you don't see too often. But then this one is just straightforward. It's just big, beautiful beasts beating up warriors. It really is a nice little cute play with the Hunter's Mark on your own minion there to proc the King Crush, which then he was in there. But then moving on, uh, 
uh, you know, Neyman and Team Kazakhstan did a good job at applying the pressure, but the twig w was a big, big deal here. If the twig was not drawn, this game does look a little bit different and probably opens up more options for Kazakhstan to take it. But guess what? It was, and there's some damage. Yeah, and I think they arguably got in their heads a little bit, got in their own heads just a little bit with that twig play because they think they just spent too long debating it, too many times arguing about what exactly they were going to do with the naturalize, what they were going to hit, what they were doing before or after the twig, and just ended up the turn being a little bit suboptimal, which just didn't matter. It was just that powerful. And Speaking of things that didn't matter, any decision Kazakhstan <laughs> made in this game five, uh, completely irrelevant. Kaliseth. All right, sure. The Edwin would Tank. have been the Edwin would have been a six six instead of an eight eight if they'd have played Killer Seth instead. And we'll say as well, you know, shout out to production for getting any replays from a game that happened thirty <laughs> seconds ago. <laughs> I was just like, Gee, I've got it's gone all over. Just like, ah. I need a highlight, quick. <laughs> yeah, they were just like the whole game. It was thirty seconds yeah. long. Let's show replay it. Play the whole thing. But yeah, that was um, that was a pretty crazy way to end that series. Let's take a look at the standings, though, as we edge towards the end of week one of the Hearthstone Global Games 2018. This may not be every single match played out. I actually don't know the full off-stream schedule off the top of my head. I apologize. I've let you all down. But let's take us some of the teams that are currently on a 1-0 and zero record. Uh, so some of the unsurprising ones to start with, uh, Germany picking up a win, South Korea picking up a win, France picking up a win. Those are some of the big names. Czech Republic, of course, the defending champions. But then joining them, some of the teams that you'll hopefully get to know and love just a little bit more as time goes on. Peru, Belarus, Chile. But then Indonesia. Yeah, that's the one that sticks out to the me. The surprise result of the week so far. Uh, we talked a lot about comparisons between them and Israel last year, who started out with some big wins over some big teams and then we got to know players like Glacer and really respect some of the play that they have. Maybe Indonesia are going to be that story in uh, Hearthstone Global Games 2018. Man, let's check out, uh, check out the predictions as well because it's so quite rightly mentioned. Korea, great team. Let's see who's going on top here. Derek, let's just not talk about him. He's not here. Uh, Falcone at 1-1, one, one, Gaskin 1-1, one, one, Lorinda, haha, -ha. and uh, the rest of us at 1-1 one, one and 2-1. Uh, Wait, the rest of us at 1-1, one, one, 2 if that makes some kind of weird sense. This is a situation where you would use as well instead of two for clarity, Raven. English Shh. tips for sort of, is it? No. <laughs> Don't try and steal my, my cool show, my cool <laughs> theme. Um, I believe that is everything from us. I did just hear something, but couldn't quite hear it. You are but that is going to be everything from us for today and for this week. This is week one the Hearthstone Global Games uh, 2018. I hope you enjoyed it, but make sure you come back with us on Monday next week as we're going to be here and we have the community show for you guys to give you some updates on what happened week one on the matches we did see and also on the matches we didn't as well some expectations and a few nods to the schedule for next week as well to see what matches we're going to be looking forward to and the matches that are going to be on stream as well. So make sure to check that out. We'll be back next week. Thanks a lot for watching. We'll see you later.